All right, so we've just finished. We just finished up last time uh, covering uh, kind of serving sizes, just kind of looking at those things, and so we left off there. And so we still have a few more things we want to uh, talk about at, in regards to nutrition. So some other things to to look at. Um, and so one of those things we want to look at is um, kind of other eating plans or other styles of eating. Uh, traditionally. Uh, what we've talked about and what most people think about when they talk about eating and nutrition is they think of your average um, kind of eating plan diet where you pretty much will eat anything or have the opportunity or are willing to eat kind of any food out there. There's no restrictions to that. Um, and so that's kind of a common thing. People just eat what's there and, and we kind of look at you being able or wanting to eat anything out there. But we do have other style eating plans. There's lots and lots of them out there. Um, but we just want to talk about a few just so you kind of get a picture that um, there are different ways that you can eat or different things you can can restrict. Um, and some of those things have valid reasons for them. Some are just options you may choose to do. Um, so one example of an alternative style eating plan where you may restrict some of the things you eat would be called the DASH eating plan. And the DASH um, the DASH eating plan stands for the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension, the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. So when you look at this DASH eating plan, um, you kind of start getting an idea of who might be eating this. A lot of people tend to think that um, someone who has hypertension, which would be high blood pressure, may go on this style diet. And some people do choose to do that when they have high blood pressure. But this design, diet is actually designed for uh, those that have just had heart attacks or very recently had a heart attack because we want to make sure their blood pressure stays low so that they don't have a, another heart attack. So it's kind of a uh, way to help prevent heart attacks if you've already had one. Um, it's a pretty strict eating style as far as what it gets rid of. What do you think... Um, what do you think changes with a DASH eating plan? What do you think someone might eat more of? And what do you think they might eat less of? What do you guys think? Eat like less fried stuff and salty stuff. Yeah, so we're pretty much going to cut almost all the salt out. Um, you're also going to cut out as much of the saturated fats as you possibly can. You're going to try to stay to just the unsaturated fat. So cutting out fried foods and red meats, trying to stick to your poultry and fish, that type of thing that are baked or, or kind of um, grilled and that type of thing. And then we're going to increase consumption of uh, vegetables and fiber and whole grains and uh, fruits. And so that's one eating style plan. And that's kind of a, uh, most people don't choose to go on the DASH eating plan. Um, it's more recommended by their doctors that they should go on it to keep them healthy. And so there are all kinds of eating plans that might happen due to health concerns that a doctor uh, might recommend. And then another example of another style eating plan would be something like uh, a vegetarian style diet. Realize vegetarian is actually an umbrella term for a variety of different eating styles. Um, it incorporates lots and lots of different styles of eating. Typically, when people say the word uh, vegetarian, someone's vegetarian or they're eating uh, a vegetarian style diet, what they truly mean is that that person is a vegan, is what most people are referring to, or a vegan style diet. Now, um, we'll talk about some different types of vegetarian, but vegan is kind of the uh, most restrictive. It has uh, the, cuts out the most things. What does being a vegan uh, mean? No meat, um, no dairy products, no eggs. Yeah. yeah. So a uh, vegan, or as a lot of people, again, say vegetarian, but realize vegetarian is, um, again, a general term. But vegan means eating no animal or animal byproduct. So you're not going to eat the flesh of an animal. You're not going to eat anything that ever came from that animal. Um, and so animal or animal byproducts or, or things that came from that. So if it ever walked, flew, swam, crawled underneath the ground, if it ever was um, actually moving um, on the earth, then that person is not going to consume it or anything that came from it. Now, with vegan style diets, that, that eating no animal or animal products or byproducts, um, there's not really, and I'm going to say there is no whatsoever, but there's probably one or two people out there, but there's no medical reason for someone to be told they need to be a vegan. Um, 
as far as to my knowledge, again, there may be one person out of, you know, seven and a half billion people, but there's no medical reason for someone to need to eat an entire vegan diet. Um, they may choose to for various reasons, uh, such as animal rights, or they don't like the taste, or uh, maybe they they know that it helps them eat better because it, it restricts some of their diet. Um, but there's no medical reason. A doctor's not going to tell you you need to be vegan. They may say you have uh, need to get rid of a specific thing out of your diet. Maybe you're allergic to it or have reactions to it, but most people aren't allergic to every animal and animal byproduct out there. So just kind of keep that in mind. Also realize a vegan diet doesn't mean healthier. Some people associate vegetarian or vegan diets as being healthier. Um, with that, it may be easier to eat a healthier diet because you cut out things that maybe you tend to eat too much of, like uh, red meats or, or you know things like that, cheeses and um, eggs and those types of things. But it doesn't necessarily mean healthier. Someone can eat a traditional style diet and say a wide variety of foods and limit the consumption of any one food, they can be very healthy. Um, and with a vegan diet, I've seen vegans that are absolutely unhealthy when it comes to their nutrition because maybe all they're eating is the same two and three vegetables all the time. Maybe they eat broccoli and spinach and kale and that's about it. That's going to leave someone just as unhealthy as if they ate uh, a lot of fried foods. Um, so keep those things in mind when it comes to your vegetarian or vegan style diet. Um, now realize when it comes to that, uh, you can choose to do it for whatever reason and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and there are other degrees of vegetarianism. So vegan is kind of your most restrictive. It, it gets rid of all animal and animal products. But then you have things like a lacto-vegetarian. What do you think is different about a lacto-vegetarian from a vegan? Drink milk. Yeah, so a lacto-vegetarian will consume milk or dairy products or, or cheeses. Uh, why they may choose to do so is completely up to them. Maybe they find that to be okay to eat. They're okay with uh, the way that that comes. Uh, maybe they don't mind the taste of it where they just don't like the taste of other animal products. Um, and so you have a lacto-vegetarian or you have things like a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, which they'll consume dairy um, and eggs. And so there are lots of different styles. There are endless styles of a vegetarian diet out there. Um, there's things like pescatarians. A pescatarian eats um, fish. They'll eat fish uh, and crustaceans, maybe things like crabs and shellfish, but they stay away from um, poultry and uh, kind of your birds and, and red meats like beef and pork. Uh, and then I have some people that I know that just don't eat red meat. So things like pork and beef, but they'll eat chicken and turkey and fish. Um, and that would be considered somewhat of a vegetarian diet because you're restricting some kind of animal consumption. The biggest thing when it comes to most vegetarian style diets, especially your vegans, um, is they just have to be a little bit more mindful of getting a complete diet. Because they are restricting some foods that they eat, they must just make sure specifically in regards to their protein consumption, getting those um, essential amino acids, they just have to be a little bit more mindful where someone who doesn't eat this way might not have to think about those things quite as much. Uh, but again, those are out there. Um, in addition to this, um, these eating plans are all different kinds out there. A very popular one right now is the, the keto style eating plan or the keto diet is a lot of times how they're referred to. Uh, with the keto uh, style diet, this is talking about consuming uh, large amounts of fat in the diet. So cutting out a lot of protein, almost all carbohydrates, being large amounts of fat. Um, this is an eating plan, but realize that it, it's not very, very beneficial. Uh, anytime you start trying to restrict and only eat one macronutrient or restricting a macronutrient out of your diet or even a micronutrient, uh, we start to see complications. Uh, the keto diet can be effective in losing weight because it's restrictive, but most people, once they stop doing that particular diet, uh, go back to where they were as far as their weight goes or uh, start having health complications for it. There is some uh, evidence that the keto diet can be good for, for certain people with certain diseases. Um, uh, an example of this is it was actually first discovered it was effective in people with epilepsy uh, that have multiple seizures. Uh, epilepsy is simply where the brain uh, is firing too quickly. It's overactive. The brain is overactive. And um, the brain works solely on glucose, so carbohydrates. And so reducing uh, the amount of glucose and carbohydrates in the system actually helps the brain to slow down and, and not 
uh, cause seizures. And it was effective in that, but it's not necessarily effective for all people. So do keep that in mind. And then finally, this kind of doesn't fit in with this slide, but it's just something that we did want to mention is we have these things called functional foods, which are simply healthy additives to foods. Uh, these are usually required by the law. Um, but uh, an example of this would be if you've ever seen orange juice that's, uh, that says contains calcium. Well, calcium isn't naturally found in orange juice, but it's added to it uh, because people realize a lot of people um, drink orange juice for breakfast instead of milk, and we need that calcium. A lot of Americans don't get enough calcium, so we put that into the orange juice in order to help people get their daily allotment of calcium. And so there are healthy additives put to food, and these are good for you, uh, and it's just something to kind of look at through time. Any questions so far? No, sir. Awesome. Thank you. So as we move forward, we, we want to talk about that there are some challenges for a special population. So a special population is anyone who would be considered not just your average person, kind of your average adult, or, or maybe they are belong to a special group. And so there are all kinds of special populations and some of our biggest ones, they're just certain things we want to consider with them. And so when we talk about children and teenagers as it comes to nutrition, uh, they have some different challenges than, let's say, college students or older adults. So when it comes to children and teens, um, you need to teach, especially teenagers, but children as well, they need to be taught how to cook and how to prepare meals. Um, if any of you are a cook or like cooking or think you're a good cook, typically, if we were to try to figure out, well, where did you learn to cook and, and where did you kind of um, fall in love with cooking or start enjoying cooking, most people tend to say they were taught by an individual, um, and typically that individual is someone in their family. Maybe it was a grandparent, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a friend, but someone actually taught them and took them the time to learn how to cook healthy meals and, and how that process goes. And then they, of course, learned on their own, but it's really important for that to happen, and it typically happens at younger ages than older ages. Uh, you don't see too many people who um, didn't know how to cook or didn't really enjoy cooking. Um, and then all of a sudden at the age of 30, they, they really just picked it up and, and learned how to do that. Um, it does happen, it's just not very common. The other thing we see with children, um, especially the earlier the younger children are, the more important it is to introduce them to a variety of different foods. This doesn't mean forcing them to eat them continuously, it just means uh, getting them to try a variety of foods. The more foods that a child tries early on, earlier on um, in their life, the more foods they're going to learn to enjoy older when they become older. Uh, they're going to have a wider variety of foods that they consume and are willing to consume, and they'll become more adventurous eaters in the fact that uh, they're willing to try newer foods uh, so that, again, they can consume a, a wider variety as they uh, continue to move through life, and this helps make sure that they get the proper nutrients and vitamins and minerals and all of everything that they need. We all have that one friend uh, who can 100%, uh, we would call them a picky eater. Uh, maybe you go out to a restaurant and every time you've gone with them, they either get the burger or they get the chicken tenders. Um, and if you talk to that person, um, they may not eat a wide variety of foods. And typically a lot of these um, weren't introduced to a wide variety of foods um, when they were, were younger. They, they kind of just ate the same few things. And so as they get older, they still eat just a, a few things. And this makes it harder for them to get the proper nutrition. Uh, my wife uh, could be somewhat considered a picky eater sometimes. Um, and so it can be a little bit harder to get her to try new things. Uh, now, she has learned to, to try new things and has found new things that she enjoys. Uh, but it definitely is a lot harder now that she's older than if she was younger trying these uh, newer style foods. College students, which all of you guys are, you just need to learn to make better decisions. Um, that's part of the college process. You're, you're kind of on your own and, and making a lot more of those decisions and money's tight and schedules are tight. And so well, college students tend to not make the healthiest decisions when it comes to uh, their diet. And so uh, trying to plan your meals out, trying to make better decisions when it comes to fast food restaurants and eating out. Um, you know, free food is the best food as a college student. And so sometimes saying no to those particular things um, is, is a way for us to make better decisions. 
Um, you then have uh, pregnant women and breastfeeding women. Uh, they need more folic acid intake. This is a B vitamin. Uh, it's very crucial to development of a child, especially in the brain. Um, and so with these particular things, um, we typically recommend they take a prenatal vitamin with this because uh, most people would have a hard time consuming enough in their daily diet. As you become older, so older over the age of about 55 or so, we know the intestines and the body just don't work quite as well as they used to. So older adults need more fluid. Um, if you've ever traveled with an older adult, you know that you have to stop for the bathroom quite a number of times, where if you were doing it on your own, you wouldn't stop quite as many times. Um, they're losing more fluid. Uh, they also need less calories. Uh, and that tends to be because older adults move less. If an older adult is very active, they don't have to reduce the amount of calories in their diet. But most, as we get older, most older people as well, every year they start to move a little less and a little less. And if they keep their food consumption the same, they're going to uh, tend to put on weight over time. And also older adults need more vitamins and minerals because their bodies just don't process uh, them the same. It's a little harder for them to absorb. And so they need to eat just a few more each day in order to make sure they get enough throughout their body. Athletes is another um, special population. Uh, with athletes, they need more calories because they're moving a ton and burning more calories. So they need to consume more calories every day to make sure they don't, uh, you know, lose too much body fat and, and lose too much weight and become unhealthy. They also typically need more fluids because they're sweating a lot of uh, fluids out during their uh, during their activity time. When it comes to anything other than what's kind of on the screen here, when it comes to anything else above that, and there are lots and lots of other concerns there may be from uh, maybe some kind of condition you have or allergies or, or whatever that may be, you do need to talk to a professional. So realize when it comes to that, you have uh, an RD and an MD that can be of assistance. Um, realize an MD is a medical doctor. This is someone who is considered a doctor. Maybe you, you'd see them at the hospital. Maybe you'd see them for your physical once a year, your checkups, that type of thing. Um, a medical doctor can give some advice on nutrition. Um, and it can be helpful based on what's going on in your, in your life as far as uh, illnesses and things like that do realize that medical doctors um, don't have that much formal training in nutrition. Uh, they take one, most doctors take one to two nutrition classes their entire uh, time going through schooling. Um, and so they're not really your best experts. They can give some general information, but they're not your best experts. Some of you in college might take as many nutrition classes as a medical doctor was has. Um, I've taken as many, if not more, nutrition classes as a medical doctor has, um, and I don't feel qualified to give you uh, nutritional advice on most things. Uh, so you do want to be somewhat um, careful of them. They're going to give you basic information. The best person to actually seek out for uh, further nutritional advice is um, what's called a registered dietitian or an RD. A registered dietitian is someone who spent their entire schooling uh, looking at this one particular chapter of nutrition. So think about spending uh, four or five years studying just this chapter. They're, they're going in depth with it. They really understand exactly what someone would needs and how to meet their needs and, and all the things that go into it. These are your professionals. They spend hours and hours in clinical trial or not current clinical trials, but clinical rotations of, of counseling people with nutrition. They have to take a, a national test to get certified as a registered dietitian and keep information up to date all the time. And so these people are really, really good. And I know uh, quite a number of them and they're really experts and are the best to be able to help you. They can tell you exactly what you should be eating with what's going on in your life. The biggest issue with these um, is most insurance companies tend not to cover them as of yet. Uh, they can be expensive as $100 and $200 an hour um, if, you're, if you're paying for them out of pocket. Um, but they're really, really great. Realize that a registered dietitian is much different than a nutritionist. Um, anyone can say that they're a nutritionist. That means nothing. I could say I'm a nutritionist. You can say you're a nutritionist. Um, you really want to make sure that that person is a registered dietitian. Um, as you move forward in schooling, as you go to bigger institutions, um, like four year bachelor programs, uh, most of these institutions, you are paying for a registered dietitian uh, that you can go speak with. And so I'd really encourage you to speak with them at one point or the other. 
Um, most of them you can see for free or for like $5 an hour. Um, I say free, but you've paid for it in your tuition. You might as well use them. If you ever want a recommendation, uh, want to speak with a registered dietitian, there are all kinds out there. You can kind of look them up. Um, I do have someone that I trust very well with um, uh, as a registered dietitian. She's the one that I go see if I need advice and contact. And um, I have worked with her for a number of years and I actually took a class from her and, and went to school with her and other things like that. And her name is Bethany Wheeler. Um, you can look her up um, online uh, and see her website, but she's really good and is really all about trying to help that person um, try, come to acceptance with everything and is really, really good if, if you want to talk to that. If you want more information, you can always email me and we can, um, I can kind of direct you to her website as well. So these are kind of the things we need to look at um, for our special populations. So now that we kind of have that under underway, um, what we want to do is we want to talk about food labels. It's really important for us to discuss food labels for at least a short while. Um, and the reason for that is back in 2016, food labels started changing. And, and you guys have seen food labels, and, and maybe you've read some. Um, but with them, it, it's really what gives us an insight into uh, the food that we're eating. It allows us to see kind of what's in them. And if it's an actual food product, the nutritional label um, actually 100% is right. It tells us exactly what's in that food. Uh, it tells us um, what percentage of our daily diet is kind of that food as well. And so those started changing a little bit in 2016. And now every food label has to meet these new standards by the beginning of this year. Um, and so um, those have changed a little bit. They still look the same, but now they're required to have added sugars um, in them. They are required to have appropriate serving sizes, or at least more appropriate serving sizes. Um, if you look at the food label on a bottle of Coke, at one time, uh, that bottle of Coke, of 20 ounce bottle of Coke, um, said that it was two and a half servings. Um, well, that was not realistic because most people that got a bottle of 20 ounce Coke uh, would consume the whole thing. So now the, those serving sizes are a little bit more accurate in showing that. Um, part of, uh, some of the other things we see is that calories on menus and vending machines, um, that's required. That's kind of the food label and you have to have access to seeing, um, in restaurants either online or, or they have to hand you something that shows the nutritional information of all their foods. Um, when it comes to our dietary supplements or any type of supplement, realize the food label is not as accurate. Uh, no one's checking to make sure it's hundred percent accurate. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and part of this food label process is sometimes we can see that um, on the food label when it lists the ingredients that there are food additives. Most of these are not harmful. They're things to help preserve the food. Maybe they add color to our food like blue dye four or something along those lines. Um, most of these are not harmful. There are some exceptions to this like MSG and sulfites. Uh, these are found naturally sometimes in some of the foods that we consume. Uh, but when we find that they're harmful, most companies tend to try to remove these from their food if possible because they don't want you to get sick or um, have long-term effects from eating their food. And so this is really important with food labels. Um, one of the things you guys are going to do is you're going to have to, I encourage you to look at a food label. You're going to have to do that for uh, one of your labs. But look at that food label and realize that when it comes to that food label, um, everything on it as far as numbers go is based per serving. Um, so one of the very first things you'll see on a food label is the fact that the serving size is listed early on. It's probably one of the most important things to look at because if you look at the back of a packaging and you see that it has 100 calories and you're like, okay, that's pretty cool. And you read all the nutritional things like added sugars and fats and, and carbohydrates and proteins. You're like, well, this product isn't too bad. It's only 100 calories. It's not maybe the best thing for me, but that's okay. Um, and let's say it's, you know, something like pretzels, awesome, or maybe even like, well, you know, some type of peanut or almond or something like that. And you're like, well, this isn't too bad. And so you eat and you eat maybe half this bag, whatever that, that is for you, you eat half this bag. And so you're thinking, oh, well, I only got 50 calories. That's not bad. I'm pretty full. But if we look at that serving size and we see that this bag you were eating out of has uh, something like 10 servings in it. well. Um, if you ate, um, 
if you ate that and you ate half that bag, well, you got five servings and that means you consume not a hundred calories, not 50 calories, but 500 calories. And so it's really important, uh, for that, um, for us to know that serving size. And then at the bottom, it'll always list our allergies. So you can see what may, you may be allergic to. And, um, you can also uh, see the ingredient list and the ingredient list lists from uh, most common product in there to least common. So the earlier something is in the ingredient list, the more of it is in that particular product. And so you definitely want to look at those particular things. Someone asked what actually is MSG. Um, MSG is, um, I don't, I can't remember exactly what it stands for. I think it's mono something. It's been a while since I've actually looked at it. Um, it's basically an ingredient in our food, kind of think of it as a chemical. Um, and we know that in large amounts over time that this can cause, um, issues with the body. Um, and so MSG is found in things like it's found in soy sauces, the way that those are made. A lot of times you find MSG, uh, it used to be found in a lot of products as a kind of a preservative and kind of give it, gave it a more of a salty flavor. Um, but that's since been removed, um, and you don't find it in a lot of products. Uh, so that's a good question. I can't exactly remember what MSG stands for, uh, but it's just in the manufacturing process. Sometimes that happens. Soy sauce is, is where a lot of people talk about it. So we're not saying soy sauce is bad. You just don't want to necessarily use like, you know, half a bottle of soy sauce every single day, or at least try to find a soy sauce that may not contain MSG, but that can be hard to do sometimes. Does that make sense, sir? Cool. So we've got these food labels. And so where we want to move to now is we do want to talk a little bit about foodborne illnesses. So when it comes to our foodborne illnesses, uh, typically think of maybe some people refer to it as uh, food poisoning or, or something like that. And realize foodborne illnesses are anything that we consume maybe is on our food that is going to make us sick in, in some form or fashion uh, through some type of pathogen. This could be a bacteria, this could be a virus, it could even be a parasite um, in some examples. And so uh, with any pathogen, think about getting sick from the flu or coronavirus or, or whatever that is, um, it's going to make you sick and a foodborne illness is going to make you sick and it just simply came from our food. And so when it comes to it, we want to try to prevent foodborne illnesses is our goal. We want to try to prevent you from getting sick from your food. And there's some steps we can take to help prevent us from getting sick to our food or sick from our food. The first one is we always want to make sure that we, we clean our food. Uh, so making sure we wash it and clean it, um, making sure that we wash our hands before we, we touch food and utilize food, um, and also cleaning surfaces. So cleaning countertops and plates and that type of thing. And a lot of people do those things quite often. This just helps get rid of any bacteria on the surfaces of those that we could then ingest. Another thing that we can do to help prevent um, foodborne illnesses is separate, separating raw and cooked foods. Uh, so if we have raw foods, um, we want to keep those in a different location than cooked foods. Um, this could be on different plates. Um, it could be in different pans. It could be in different spots in the refrigerator. And if we, we put something, if we remove something uncooked from the refrigerator, making sure we clean that area to kill any uh, pathogens that might be there. Um, so typically where most people get this kind of confused or maybe mix this up, I've seen it a few times is, uh, maybe you're cooking, let's say chicken. Um, and so maybe, let's say you're grilling it out, you know, it's starting to get nice outside. So maybe you're starting to grill it. And so you go out to the grill and you carry out that chicken on a plate and you put that chicken down on the grill. And so you're cooking the chicken and all of a sudden it becomes done and you put that chicken right back on the plate that you brought it out on. Well, this has now negated any of the, the killing of pathogens that you did while cooking because there are those pathogens still on the plate from the raw food. And so you would need to get a separate plate to put that on or at least have gone and washed that plate before you put the cooked chicken back on it. And so this is a big thing is to make sure those are separated um, so that the, the raw food doesn't uh, put germs onto the cooked food. And so that brings us into a, another probably the most effective thing we can do to get rid of pathogens and get rid of foodborne illnesses um, is to cook our food. 
cooking our food um, kills pathogens. It kills bacteria. It kills parasites. It kills um, viruses in our food. Um, what temperature, what internal temperature, so like the middle of the food, what temperature does food need to reach in order to make sure that we kill all the, all the pathogens that could be in our food? What's the minimum temperature that people tend to, to say? Like in the hundreds. I know that. Okay. Like 130, I think. So we said in the hundred, so that's kind of general. There's a big range there, 130. Uh, we definitely actually want to get it higher. And so it's actually around an internal temperature of 165 degrees is what's recommended. So if you get your, your food, the basically the center of your food up to 165 degrees, um, that means the whole food has reached that temperature. Um, we know that we've killed pretty much everything that could could make us sick from that food. Not always 100%, but 95% of it, 99% of it we've killed. Um, so we really wanna make sure our foods reach that internal temperature of 165 degrees to make sure we do this. And this would be all foods. This would be every food that you can think of. Um, we want to cook them. I prefer all every food that I eat. I prefer it cooked and I prefer it cooked to hitting that. It's just kind of the way I, I prefer it. It's, it's kind of a preference thing. Some people don't like their foods cooked all that much, um, but realize that is inherently a little bit more dangerous. Um, when we don't cook our foods to an internal temperature of 165 degrees, there is some risk um, of that food making us sick. Now, some foods are more risky than others. What's an example of a food that most people don't cook? Uh, they eat it without cooking it whatsoever, and there's very little risk of it making us sick. What would be an example of this? Egg. So um, not necessarily eggs, not, not necessarily sushi, but someone here put a banana. A banana is a great example. Most of our fruits and vegetables um, – most people don't cook those. We eat a lot of fruits, especially fruits raw, um, and that's perfectly okay. Um, most of those aren't going to make us sick. We're very unlikely to get sick from eating um, uncooked or raw fruits and vegetables. However, that doesn't mean we're 100% safe. We could, from eating a raw banana, there is a chance that we get sick. Now, if you cook that banana to 165 degrees, um, you might not enjoy it as much, but you're definitely preventing yourself from getting sick from it. And so some things have little to no risk like fruits and vegetables, but realize, think about lettuce. There's been lots of cases of lettuce making people sick. Cooking that lettuce would actually get rid of that, that risk. So we have things like that. Um, and then we start working our way up into foods that are a little bit more risky. So they're a little bit more likely to make us sick, but they're still relatively safe if people eat them undercooked or raw. And so an example of this would be like sushi. Uh, someone had mentioned uh, sushi. I like to eat all of my fish again cooked. I, I like to eat my vegetables and uh, fruits cooked as well. But when it comes to fish, sushi, that type of thing, you can eat um, raw fish. People do it all the time and, it, and it's relatively safe. Um, anytime you're not cooking it though, there is some inherent risk that it could make you sick. So you do have to realize that. Um, and so when it comes to them, it's, it's your choice, it's your decision, but if you're going to make a decision to eat raw or undercooked food, you may just want to consider where it's been kept and how it's been prepped. So if you go to a nice Japanese steakhouse or sushi kind of place that, that you know treats everything properly, you're probably pretty safe. If you make your own sushi and you know where that fish came from and that it was stored properly, it's probably pretty safe and not going to make you sick. If you walk into the Swifty Save gas station down the street, um, and you walk in and they say, ooh, sushi on sale today. And like right at the front counter, kind of in this open refrigerated section, they have sushi for sale, like 10 pieces for a dollar. You may not want to get that because maybe it's more likely to make you sick. Uh, the same thing goes with steak. Steak can be eaten raw or undercooked. And I've, I've tried it this way. and It's just not my preferred way. But anytime you're eating steak that is undercooked or raw, you're more likely to get sick from it. It doesn't mean that you will just means that you're more likely so cooking it all the way and then there are some foods that uh, we know that if you don't cook them um, all the way through that they're almost like 100% going to make you sick or they're like very very likely to make you sick what's an example of a food that if we don't cook it and we eat it raw or undercooked very likely to make us sick chicken brown yeah. beef 
chicken. So ground beef, not necessarily. Um, a lot of people get their burgers uh, that way, uh, but chicken and a lot of our pork products um, are this way. If you don't cook um, chicken, we know that it's most likely going to make you sick. Um, you never hear of anyone at a restaurant when you order the chicken breast, the waiter being like, how would you like that cooked? And someone being like, oh, I'd love it at a nice medium, uh, medium or medium rare. Most people don't cut into chicken and be like, well, it's slightly pink. It's close enough. No, we know people don't do that because they know it's likely to make them sick. Um, and so you have to keep those things in mind. Um, and then we also want to make sure that after you cook foods uh, that you do chill them or refrigerate your foods or freeze them. Um, and this is so that bacteria doesn't grow on them. Uh, when food is left at room temperature, it's very easy and very quick for bacteria to grow. And so if you're not putting foods into a refrigerator, um, we know that, that those can grow bacteria quickly and cause you to get sicker quicker. Uh, and this is why a lot of people in Georgia uh, around July, when there's a lot of family reunions, a lot of people get sick because Aunt Sally made some potato salad with a lot of mayonnaise and eggs in it. Um, and so then that grew bacteria in the hot, you know, 90 degree heat very quickly and people ate it and became sick. So we do say uh, very quickly your foods need to go from being cooked to being stored in the refrigerator. Uh, the question is always, well, how long can food stay good in the refrigerator? It depends. Some foods can be good for a little while, um, some for, for quite a bit longer. Um, and it's kind of a personal thing. I do say if you're going to eat a food that's been in the refrigerator, make sure you look at it. You know, if it smells funny, looks funny, is slimy, has a funny color to it, don't eat it. Um, but uh, general rule at my house is about seven days, so about a week. If I cook a food today and I get to um, – uh, this day next week, um, I'm not going to eat it any longer. Um, but I know people who don't eat anything after it's been kind of sitting there for a while. Um, my uh, wife tends to be more of a, a two, three day kind of person. I know people that go two, three weeks, but it's really a personal thing. You just want to be careful with it. If you do happen to get sick from um, eating your food, uh, you get something like a stomach bug, you get a foodborne illness, food poisoning. Um, typically, it's going to result in a lot of uh, diarrhea and possibly vomiting. So you just really need to drink fluids and get plenty of rest. Uh, most of these go away within 6 to 24 hours. They usually don't last much longer than that. Um, you may need to seek medical help by going to the hospital if your symptoms are extreme. So if you have diarrhea and vomiting and you can't keep any fluids down because you can become dehydrated, or if it lasts for more than about 24 hours, you definitely want to go seek medical help um, just to make sure it's nothing uh, too worrisome. And so this is kind of our foodborne illnesses. Um, a couple other things we want to consider uh, when it comes to this or other things to look at is food irradiation. Food irradiation is another kind of, um, it's another way to help prevent bacteria and for food from making us sick. This is already happening to your food. It's not advertised because people get freaked out by the word radiation. Um, we're not eating foods that have been exposed to radiation isn't going to turn you into Spider-Man. Uh, they're exposed to radiation, small doses of radiation to kill all the bacteria and viruses um, on that food. So lettuce is an example of foods that are irradiated and it kills all the bacteria and viruses and actually helps them to last longer um, before they start to, to rot. Um, and it makes our food safer for us. It's a good thing. But as soon as that food comes out on the other side of this machine that, that shows the radiation to it, um, the radiation has 100% dissipated. It's just simply there to kill um, the bacteria and the viruses. Uh, another thing to, to kind of talk about is organic food. Um, organic, if, if something is labeled organic, it has had to meet a certain set of standards. It's a very strict set of, set of standards. Um, and organic simply means uh, more natural. Uh, typically, it's more natural process. So uh, you're not using man-made chemicals uh, to grow food. You're, you're not using man-made pesticides and man-made fertilizers. You're using more natural ways to do that. Realize when it comes to organic, um, organic does not mean healthier. No, organic does not mean more nutritious. It simply means more natural ways of growing that. And so that sometimes can be beneficial and sometimes uh, doesn't add anything. If you take an apple, um, a, a regular apple just grown however, and you take an organic apple, realize nutritionally they have the same amount of calories, the same vitamins and nutrients. They're the exact same nutritionally. Just one was grown with more natural um, uses. 
Now, if you're worried about consuming pesticides and chemicals and things like that, organic can be an option for you. It, it tends to be a little bit more expensive. Um, and so I'm not, I don't eat organic. It's more expensive and, and typically the body's going to get rid of, in my opinion, most, most pesticides that we consume. Uh, but if you're going to make those decisions, uh, you may just want to consider some things over others if, if cost is an issue. Um, some things like an apple that you eat the outside of may make sense to buy organic. Maybe that makes more sense to you. Uh, but for some things it, it may not make as much sense to buy organic, such as a banana. If, if only a banana had an outside covering that protected it uh, from, and, and that we could take off before we ate the fruit. Oh, oh it does. It, it's a pill. A banana pill protects that fruit on the inside. So uh, organic bananas might not make as much sense as organic apples if cost is an issue. If, if cost is not an issue, by all means, do exactly what you would like. Um, also realize organic um, natural does not mean things are safer. We want to picture people growing organic crops releasing ladybugs to control all of the all of the uh insects that could eat that fruit or or vegetable that's just not practical on a large scale so they find natural chemicals that that get rid of um that get rid of um these these insects that are going to eat their fruit and so a natural thing is arsenic arsenic is 100 percent natural uh, but if you don't know arsenic is very deadly to humans but because it is a natural substance, you could spray arsenic across an organic crop and it could still be labeled arsenic. And it is more deadly than a lot of the other chemicals being used out there. So do just be aware of those things. And then finally, when it comes to fish consumption, fish can contain mercury. Uh, this is a natural element and it's not good for the body. A buildup of mercury in your system uh, can cause something called a mad hatter's disease and, and basically goes into your brain and um, you go crazy. Um, and, and can eventually lead to death and a lot of brain damage. Now, it takes a little bit, and, and with these things, if, if you don't consume a lot of fish throughout your life, maybe you consume it once or twice every couple months, uh, this isn't as much of a concern. If you consume a lot of fish products, this is a, a much bigger concern. Uh, some can, fish contain low levels of mercury, some moderate amounts of mercury, and some very high amounts of mercury. Um, and so you can find lists in your book and online that kind of indicate which fish have high and which ones have low. If you eat a lot of fish, we stay, stay away from anything with high um, levels of mercury. Eat them very, very rarely. Um, if they have moderate amounts of mercury in them, we say eat them just occasionally and then try to stay at the lower level, like where they have very low amounts of mercury in them. Uh, people that eat a lot of fish over a lot of time, uh, that mercury can build up in their system because there's no real easy way to get mercury out of the out of the body. Um, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, we stay. We we really recommend um, only eating the lowest level of mercury in fish, uh, eating at that lowest level because uh, babies are more susceptible to this than anyone else. Uh, so far, so good, guys. Yes. Cool. So. One last thing that we, we kind of want to cover is we want to talk about eating better. If, if you've noticed so far in this particular chapter, I've given you some, some basic guidelines and, and not really a whole lot more. It's kind of giving you basic information saying you need to eat a wide variety of foods. And so we want to talk about, well, what are some, some basic things we can do to eat better? Uh, we can improve our nutrition, but not having to carry around measuring cups and, and think about every number that we consume because that can uh, lead to some negative uh, things in our lives. So some general recommendations to eating better um, would be, first of all, track your habits. Figure out what you're currently doing. Before you start trying to change your diet, figure out what's going on in your diet and what you may need to change um, and, and what's going to be the easiest for you or what's going to make the biggest effect in your life. Don't just start changing things like, oh, I'm going to become vegan because that's healthier. Well, it may or may not be for you depending on what's going on. Um, when you start trying to change your eating habits, make sure you do it slowly. Um, nice and slow kind of things are going to be sustainable. Uh, if you try to change multiple things in your diet, uh, or if you try to change too quickly, like I'm going from eating nothing but little Caesars and cookout all the time, uh, to next week, I'm going to just eat nothing but salads. I'm not likely to uh, stick with that. So I'd be better off just maybe trying to change one meal that week and slowly work my way up. And so going back to those strategies we talked about in chapter one is a really good um, thing to do. Another easy way that we can um, eat better is to make meals at home and, and plan our meals out for the week. 
when we make meals at home, we get to control what goes into them. Uh, so we get to control how much, how much of different things is in there. We can choose to, to change the type of fat in there, go from a saturated fat to an unsaturated fat. We can, uh, put less, um, sugar in it. We can, uh, make sure that we're, we're doing things with a variety of foods that have a lot of vitamins and minerals. We, we get to choose that. And then when we plan meals out for a week, um, we're more likely to make better decisions. If you go this week and just say, ah, I'll figure it out, you know, I'll figure out dinner tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Well, if you're tired and you've had a long day, uh, you're probably going to pick whatever easiest and cheapest, um, where if you had planned out for the week and said, this is the meal I'm going to do for today and already bought everything to cook it, you're more likely to stay with that because you spent money on it and had a plan in your head all day long. Um, another big thing we can do is control our portions. Um, portion control is a big thing, especially for Americans. Our portions are quite large. Uh, most of the time, the portions we eat are much larger than they need to be. We saw that on that little slide, especially if we go to restaurants um, or fast food places. The portions are very large uh, for those areas. It's not uncommon for some restaurants to serve you a dish that is three to four portions. Portions um, can have thousands of calories in each of those meals, so you do have to keep that in mind. Um, so what's a practical way, what's a real easy way to eat less or, or to eat a smaller portion at a restaurant or a fast food restaurant? What do you think that could be? Instead of getting fries, get the fruit. So we could get the fruit instead of the fries. That might not necessarily help us control portions. That, that may be a better option, has more nutrients. But one way to control portions at a restaurant would simply be uh, to only eat half the meal that you ordered. Um, so for me, if I go out to a restaurant, if I want to control portions, it doesn't always happen. Uh, but I could ask for when I order the meal, say, hey, can you bring me, can you bring me half of that in the to-go box as soon as you bring it out? It can't sit on my plate or I'm going to eat the whole thing, but I'll simply say, hey, I would like this and just bring me a to-go plate out as soon as you bring my meal and just put half of it in the to-go plate. And so not only did I eat less, I got two meals for the price of one. And if my parents paid for it, I got two meals for free. The key with that is you can't eat, um, you can't eat that as soon as you get into the car. You have to wait until the next meal to kind of eat that. Um, another way to control portions maybe at your home is to buy is to buy smaller plates, bowls, and cups. So legitimately buying smaller plates, bowls, and cups at your house, you'll consume less. When we eat food, it's a visual thing. Um, and so we see a full plate and we feel fuller. So if you have big plates and you only fill it halfway up, you may still feel full after that. And so this has been proven that if you buy just smaller plates, bowls, and cups, you're going to eat less at your house. Um, at the end of the day, when it comes to eating better, you have to remember your goal. Like what, what's your goal of eating? Is it to get healthier? Is it for whatever that is? Cause that's going to help you keep track. Uh, make sure that you seek out a registered dietitian as they can provide more support. And they're the experts in this particular area, not a nutritionist, a registered dietitian, much different. And then finally, my biggest suggestion is um, everything in moderation, including moderation. So everything that you eat, just eat it in moderation. You can eat pizza. That's fine. Just don't eat a whole pizza. Don't eat pizza every single week. Eat it, you know, every couple of weeks. Um, eat a wide variety of foods in moderation and, and smaller portion sizes and you'll do well. And this also includes moderation. Uh, you know, you don't want to eat a gallon of ice cream and a pizza in one day. That, that's not great. But sometimes you need those days. There's a, there are those days where we just want to eat everything. We don't want to care about what we eat. We want to eat whatever we want and the quantities we want. And it's okay to have those days. You can say, you know what, this Saturday, I'm going to eat whatever. I'm going to eat a gallon of ice cream. I'm going to eat a whole pizza. I'm going to eat whatever I want to. And that's perfectly fine to have those days. Your body uh, loves those days and it's good for that. If it's craving it, it can use one. But we only want those to happen every couple of months. We don't want that to happen every week or every couple of days or, or, or every even couple of weeks. We, we just want to occasionally have those days where we throw moderation out the window and say, I'm going to eat whatever I want and I don't care. And that's perfectly fine. And so everything in moderation, including moderation. Does that make sense? Yes. Awesome. So, 